Hi, I'm Kirk Jowers, and for this episode of Ask doTERRA, we have Dr. David K. Hill, the Chief Medical Officer of doTERRA, and one of our founding executives. And one of my favorite parts of working at doTERRA is that my office is right next to Dr. Hill, and I get to go in every day, almost every day. <laughs> I think that's your favorite part. I don't know if it's my it's, favorite part, it's, but it's, it's, it's okay. It's not considered a benefit for you, but to ask about my son, my wife, my dog. She don't seem to like my dog questions as much as my, my family questions, but you're always so nice. Um, and so for this one, we, we, we turned it open to our, our followers on our different social media, and we got something like 500 different questions. And one question came through, which I had, I had I'd learned about about five months ago, sure. and I had buried it deep, Doc. I had buried it deep, and then I would buried it deeper because I was so angry. I was so upset, and, and I never wanted to talk about it again. I certainly didn't want you to know because you have devoted your life to helping people with essential oils. I walk in and you're reading these medical texts, which I don't think I could even lift. So I'm just going to ask it flat. There is a company, a fairly large, reputable company that sells retail essential oils, and they have every oil, <laughs> every oil for the exact same price. These are 100% pure, it says. 100% pure oils, and they are all the exact same price. So frankincense, frankincense where you get from Somalia or some other Middle Eastern countries, they are like one tree in a desert, versus lemon where there are thousands of, thousands of lemons on a tree, thousands of trees in what they call an orchard, as I understand it. How, how is that possible? Well, you're not the first person to ask me that question, and it, uh, it does, beg some interest. It is something that you should respond to. You know, if we look at essential oils, I think there's a couple of ways to talk about this, is that people a lot of times have their own descriptors of what an essential oil is. And for my purposes, and I think for everyone's purposes at large, a good thing to do is to consider what's the intended use of the essential oils. So essential oils are not new. They're not something that people are unaware of. They're not new to industry. And so they're utilized in a lot of different ways. And so it becomes at some point an argument for economies of scale, that if we look at all of the essential oil use in the world, we most likely far surpass the actual amount of essential oils that are actually being distilled and being created in the way and in the context that we do at doTERRA. Which means that, of course, what you're ending up with is a derivative of chemistry, but not necessarily meaning that it's an essential oil. I, I think if we're looking at oils in the context of, I want something along the lines of, instead of Febreze, I want to use an essential oil, or in, instead of some other commodity that I might think of in a commercial sense, I just want to use an essential oil, those would be a good alternative for you. But if you're interested in health, if you're interested in the therapeutic benefits that we receive from what truly is an essential oil by scientific definition, then those don't fit that category at all. Not in the way that they're produced, not in the chemistry that's housed within them. So I've, I've learned not to be angry about that <laughs> because it, uh, for the people who really know and understand the benefits of essential oils, they already understand that there's no way that you could possibly go through some of the dynamic of how we receive essential oils. The labor-intensive process is much of the time that's associated with receiving an essential oil in its pure form, in that therapeutic form that we need and want. There's no way that you could do that and then consequently sell that oil for four or five dollars. So it, just common sense will tell you something is amiss, something doesn't really register. But I think it's more simplistic than even that. People are just categorizing oils differently. And these oils that we're going to talk about today and that we represent in doTERRA always are for health benefits, not for common household uses. And so it's just not the same thing. Well, and you've counseled me on my anger. More, <laughs> diffuse more peace and less passion oil, a little more cedarwood, a little less cinnamon or, or whatever. Um, but it just... To me, it just completely defies common sense because you walk sure. through a, a supermarket and a raspberry costs it, it costs a different amount than pineapples versus broccoli versus kale. Yeah. These are natural products, and I don't mean to trash on lemon. In fact, I just put some lemon in my in my water there, um, and that takes 45 lemons to create this bottle. But 
probably the most single impactful photo I've seen since I've been at doTERRA. I've been here for one year now was Dave Sterling when he came back from Somalia and he had that right. picture from his his uh, his iPhone of this tree growing off the side of a cliff. Side of a cliff. It's just this. You wonder you wonder how it survives. You wonder how it grows. Right. It's not like those gorgeous orchards in Italy. <laughs> in where Italy, the, yeah. That's um, right. So while we're talking about frankincense, so I get it. Some, they're selling synthetic things like Skittles. You've got a blue raspberry. Never seen that in the wild, but it's available um, through the through the magic of of candy makers. Um, now we get to essential oils. Um, I spend a lot of time with our sourcing people and they talk about the best places to get these essential oils. Some of these aromatic plants grow Correct. in different places, sure. but not sure. all are created equal, of course. <clears throat> they aren't. So um, frankincense. Somalia is not the easiest place to get, <laughs> to get an oil out. It would be easier to get it in some of our Middle Eastern countries who are friends with our country. They don't have some of the inner turmoil. Why is that chem the chemistry of, of the Somalian frankincense so important to be in doTERRA well, let's, oils? Let's talk about it as a whole. Let's, let's not just isolate, I mean, let's talk about frankincense, but let's not just isolate into that exclusively. And let's talk about it as a whole, because I think when we, we've already distinguished now that there's, there's probably two main categories of what people would commonly refer to as essential oils. To be technical, I wouldn't call that other category really an essential oil. It, has similar chemistry, but really synthetically derived. That's the challenge that's there. And then we have this category of therapeutic benefit. And that's an entirely different proposition. It's a different proposition because one of the primary requirements for that is what you speak to, how you're sourcing the essential oil. And not necessarily because of a botanical name or a specific species of essential oil, if we look at therapeutic benefit, regardless of the context, if we look at those health outcomes that we're trying to create, it's got to be associated with the chemistry of that oil. So there's two really important concepts there. One has got to be the purity of the oil itself. We really don't want any of that other category to find its way into these oils that we want for therapeutic benefit or for our family health uses. We just don't want that. So let's talk about it then in the context of purity and let's talk about it in the context of chemistry which is really creating that excitement. So when you look at the essential oils and you look at frankincense now, there's lots of different species of frankincense, but if we look at the chemotypes of frankincense or the specific chemistry within frankincense, it's a little more telling. So if we look at whether we're sourcing oil from Somaliland or we get an oil like Sakra from Oman, for example, we still have to go through this assessment and this analysis of what's the intended uses and what is the chemistry profile that's going to allow us to do that. So we can rank oils in a lot of different ways. For example, we can rank oils through odor. And some people would say that if we rank it with odor, then Serrata as a frankincense oil might not be very pristine. It might not be what we're looking for. But if we look at Serrata's chemistry, it might be a little more advantageous to us. Sacra, for example, in some contexts is considered to be somewhat inferior. But if we look at it chemically, it can have a real value to us. So we primarily source three different types of frankincense oil. We source Carterii, Freriana, and Sacra. But if we look at the chemistry of each one of those, when we see Carterii and when we see Freriana, regardless of where they come from, if we get the purity and we get the chemistry profile that we're looking for, we have great diversity, which means we have lots of opportunity for therapeutic outcomes. If we look at Sacra, there's some criticism sometimes that can fall to Sacra because Sacra almost unilaterally is just one primary compound, alpha pinings, and it can be as much as 80%, which means we don't get the chemical diversity. So while we might say that that's not as chemically diverse, maybe that's not as valuable, it actually has valuable in the context of the three. I would be highly critical if the only frankincense oil that we sourced was Sacra, because there's great limitation in some of the benefit you can receive from that because of the isolation of chemistry. So it's the whole process that you got to look at, and this is what makes our model so dynamic and also so powerful and very unique to doTERRA, that we really do end up with essential oils that are not only correct chemically, 
not only do we have the purity, but they have the intended outcomes we're looking for, and they're very unique to doTERRA. They're exclusive to doTERRA. So entirely different categories and allows us to look at oils for their benefits and value in a way that we couldn't otherwise do. Well, and that's been an interesting discovery for me is to learn that there are different species of these different plants, that there are different locations can have a huge impact on that's the right. chemistry. That's right. So we're talking about frankincense. I know we get a lot from Somalia. Mm -hmm. We get some from Oman. Um, can you kind of explain how and yeah, why that I, works out? I mean, you, you need to source oils from different places just simply because of the chemistry profiles and the influence that environment and other things have on that. And we do source oils from those areas, including Oman. Our sakura comes from Oman. Um, it's, I think a lot of times people like to claim or they like to say that we're the only ones who can do this. We're the only ones who can export essential oils or export the resin from this area of region of the world that's that's not true there's no governing body for that it really becomes a process of relationships and how you're sourcing and working with those growers and those farmers in those areas so we do that more effectively than anyone else and i, I we do that all over the world and oman is certainly no exception that's one thing I love about asking you these questions, some about... <laughs> because I ramble on forever? <laughs> no, because, uh, because I, came from, I came from an area where I didn't know essential oils. I was in right, right. D.C. law firm, politics, uh, academia, and I, I, I didn't quite understand it. And so um, I, I like that when I ask you questions about here's what my daughter is experiencing and what, what would help her, um, you won't just say use this oil, you would talk about the chemistry and, and it helps me understand it and, and you, you bring everything back to, uh, to the chemistry and to the, to the benefits that come out of well, it. I, I think there's something, I would say two things to that just real quickly. First, I, I love the fact that you <laughs> come from the background that you come from because to me you're the typical user of essential oils someone whom probably does not know all of the chemistry and I, I don't know all the intended outcomes and I, I don't even know all the time how to use this oil exactly perfect. All the more reason why that discussion we just had is so critical. You need to be able to trust that process. That having been said, there's another side that's associated with this that I think that we recognize that the sophistication, the science associated with essential oils has changed, it's developed, it's an emerging market. It's, an, it's not only something that is mandatory within the process that we're now looking at with essential oils, but if you're not heavily involved in that, you're doing the public at large a great disservice. And doTERRA is a science company. So we have no choice but to look at the essential oils for those intricacies, because it's those intricacies that allow us to make better choices and better decisions about what oils we're actually going to provide, what oils we're going to make available for people to use, because you need to be able to trust that process. Well, it was exciting for me, having lived a lot of my life in Washington, D.C., and, and worked in those circles, that when, uh, when Gallup and the Diplomatic Courier right, put right. on that, the Wellness Summit, the annual Wellness Summit, where Gallup does its 50-state survey and unleashes that, and, uh, that they, and they, they had these amazing... They've, they've always had it, but they had these amazing speakers, including from the Obama administration, from his right, cabinet. Right. Uh, they wanted you to be which, one Which was of a the, little nerve-wracking. I wasn't quite <laughs> sure why they wanted me there, but yeah, that's true. Well, that's and, true. And, and I know why, so though. It was it's a great been, honor, actually. I, it I was, that it. historic building, um, and to hear so many people's um, discussion about wellness. and Yeah, it was this really lively environment where there was this discussion about the changes that exist, now, I, you could say in healthcare because there were certainly those very specific discussions, but I think it was really also kind of monumentous in that it was a change, it was a discussion that was being perpetuated on the expectations in health, which is a little bit different conversation, but why I think there's this great interest that exists now 
with essential oils, these more lifestyle approaches that we can do as individuals collectively. So it was, it was a really interesting environment to be in, but <laughs> a little bit challenging too. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Well, I continue to get comments. I was just in DC last week and had, had people talk to me about it and ask me questions about the oils. And so I, I tried my best to plagiarize <laughs> the things that you've told me over the years or just send them to your, to your talk. But, um, one, one question that came up prominently um, from, from our social media request for questions, and again, we had almost 500 uh, last I looked, which was, I think, last night, uh, was the internal use of, of, of the oils. oils. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I'd just love to get your take on that. That is a question that, uh, that more sophisticated people are asking, and I ingest a lot of them, and so I'd like to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> well, it I was know. you, by the way, who taught me that Past tense was not a single use application. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. So, you know, anything you can help us with that, I'd appreciate. Well, I, th I think this <laughs> is, uh, it's a difficult question in some ways because we're not just dealing with the basics of science and human physiology and the chemistry of oils. There's, there's an emotion uh, tied to some of this. Historically, if we look at essential oils, there, it's easy to find value in the uses of oils as they've existed historically. And internal use is one of those models. It's not something that's new. I'm surprised sometimes at the criticism that comes in, and I've, over time, have decided that the criticism primarily comes because people are largely saying, I personally don't agree with that or don't want to do that. And so my first message in response to that would be, don't. We all work within the comfort level of our knowledge, of our experience, of how we feel like the oils work best for us. So in my household, for example, we have individual preference. I happen to use the oils in all of those ways. I use them topically and aromatically, and I use them routinely internally because I like what it does for me. So we could have this big, long discussion now and talking about metabolism in the body and talking about usage of essential oils, and we're beginning to discover more and more about how oils are metabolized and where the benefits are coming from. That's a very exciting frontier, but I don't think that's where we want to go today, and I don't think that's where the answer really lies. I think it lies in the more basic elements of just human physiology. So the argument, as I oftentimes hear, is that it's just damaging to the tissues. It's damaging to the mucal layers within the body, and it just you could never do that. Well, first off, we, we never purport that people should abuse or misuse the essential oils. I, I think that's something for everyone to remember, that if you're going to do things that encourage personal responsibility for your health, like essential oils, then you absolutely need to learn how to use them most effectively. And that includes models of safety. But to say that using oils internally is unsafe would also be inappropriate. So let's look at mucous membranes for just a moment. And if you understand the process of mucal layers within the body, if you understand the production of mucus from the goblet cells and the specialized tissue layers, the mucus itself really prevents contact with those specialized tissues themselves. It actually acts as a transport and a protective mechanism. And in fact, there's a lot of research that talks about how internal usage of essential oils actually is sustaining and supportive of those tissues and those functions very specifically in the body. So I, I have a hard time with it in the context of saying physiologically, there's some reason why we shouldn't do that. That just does not make sense the very basic understanding of human anatomy and physiology would tell you that that's incorrect. However, I understand the emotion that's associated with it, so the encouragement I often give people is, then let's use oils in the realm that you're most comfortable with, but let's continue to learn how to use them most effectively and as safely as we possibly can. We should be careful not to be critical of people who have found great value in a process or a method of use that for us maybe doesn't make sense, but for them maybe has been the complete solution. I talked to a number of people whom internal use is not only the best option for them, it oftentimes is the only option for their use because of some of the other issues that they're dealing with. So if we look at the, really, the simpleness of human physiology and have some basic understanding of that, we really categorically would say, yes, you can use oils internally. I'm glad to know because I use them quite a bit. 
Uh, but I'm even happier because I spend, you're, you're generous in allowing me occasionally to, to come with you and, and to, to read some of the reports that you're going through. You have some amazing uh, partnerships with Johns Hopkins and Duke and, and other phenomenal universities, medical centers, practitioners from around That's right. the That's world. Right. Um, and, and, and I appreciate uh, how much you and your team of scientists and your medical team spend uh, to ensure that we are up to date, not only on the chemistry, but on the safety. Well, and you've said it correctly, it's a team of individuals. I, I would never want anyone to believe that somehow any of us work in isolation. I mean, we're so far past that now and the needs that we have. And so I'm fortunate in that I do, you know, on staff here, I have a lot of PhDs and scientists and we're focused on this exclusively. But in that outside environment, I do. We, we for example, in this internal use model, I, that wasn't just an arbitrary thing. I, it's nice to consult with ear, nose, and throat specialists. It's nice to consult their research. And we work with our partners very heavily in that way. And it does two things. It allows us to really assess things fully and make the correct decisions. But the other thing that it allows us to do is it allows us to be forward thinking. It allows us to look at essential oils beyond just what we know about them, but for the possibility of what they may do and what we can understand about them in the future. So a lot of our processes that way become linked. They become linked in what it is we're trying to accomplish and understand and un unravel and unfold through research. And they become linked in this partnership with all of these wonderful individuals and institutions and it's a great mode of discovery, but it's also a very exciting environment to be in. And in the end, we get the benefit through what we portray and do with the essential oils. <laughs> I love your passion about it. I re we were in Nashville, and I don't think I can disclose here because it might come out later, but uh, one of these great institutions had done some incredible studies. And, that's right. That's and right. you were talking about it as if, you know, your son had just won the Super Bowl or something. It was, it was, well, I uh, get really excited about this because when you, when you find people, it's one thing to have passion for the oils in your home, right. which I and my family do. But it's another thing to have passion in the professional world in which you live and work. And to find this enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm and energy for the discoveries that are being made. And for us to not only be a part of that, but to drive a lot of that is extremely rewarding. So for me, it really does kind of feel that way a lot of times. I'm amazed at the partnerships that we have, but just deeply grateful because of the energy that that brings and the enthusiasm as you go through those processes. And at times make discoveries that you've thought to be true, you believe to be true, but now you know to be true and you can see that and share that. That's, that's powerful. Well, thank you so much. We have about 350 questions to go, <laughs> but I don't think we'll get those done today, uh, but hopefully you'll come back and we'll continue to, to talk through these questions that our wellness advocates and others have for us. It's always my pleasure, Kirk, and uh, I, I think I would want everyone to know very clearly. Our greatest desire is to help people use the essential oils for their greatest benefit and the outcomes that they're looking for. So we're, we're always happy to help in any way we can. Thank you so much for joining us today and please continue to send in your questions using the hashtag AskDoTerra.